Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Your Football Opinion. I am your host, Theo Ash, and we are settled into things here. Week two is in the books. It was a week of upsets in the NFL. Uh, I did a good job, I thought, on my upset watch, picked a couple games correctly. I could have said really any game this week and been right. So it was kind of a, a Mickey Mouse victory. The Falcons beat the Eagles. The Raiders beat the Ravens. The Buccaneers beat the Lions. The Packers with Malik Willis beat the Colts. The Saints beat the Cowboys. Uh, the Vikings beat the 49ers. Were the Bills dogs in the Thursday night game as well? I think they might have been, although uh, that one isn't really to the level as the others. But oh my goodness, just everything turned on its head this week. And what to make of it? What to make with? What to make of it? We'll go through some of these upsets today. We're gonna start with Falcons versus Eagles. The Monday night game went final yesterday. A shocking loss for the Eagles. It looked like they had it well at hand. Um, I saw that it was a top 10 most improbable comeback since 2016 is, I believe, what the number was. ESPN has its chart, its graph that it makes of win percentages and likelihoods. And I think at one point, uh, the Falcons had like a 0.2% chance to win uh, when the fourth down happened and C.J. Gardner-Johnson got that hit. Definitely took his helmet off, but I'm glad it wasn't called. You know, don't need the game to get derailed on something like that. Let's talk about this. I thought the Eagles' offense looked okay for the most part. Obviously, going without A.J. Brown, the explosives are going to be tougher to come by. And yeah, there were no 70-yard bombs this week, unfortunately, uh, like they had versus Jair Alexander. In early in the second half last week. It was more chip, chip, chip away. And when you lack that explosive threat, your room for error does go down. Penalties sunk the Eagles. Um, I, I still think Hertz isn't making the greatest decisions when to keep the ball and when to hand it off on some of the RPOs or throw it. And there were some people downfield on those RPOs as well. So the execution on that aspect of the game still isn't gone back to Steichen levels uh, at any rate. I'm a little bit concerned about the Jahan Dotson trade. I mean, this is why you wouldn't got him in case one of your top two gets hurt. He can come in there and be a starter for you. They traded a day two pick for him. He was expensive for a role that only got you know less than 200 yards last year, that third wide receiver spot. This is the types of game game where he's supposed to be worth it. And they're dumping the ball off to somebody they already had on the roster. He's he's the new offensive threat, Britton Covey. And Dotson is just totally silent. So there were flaws with the offense, but I thought Hertz played well. I did. I, I know that there was kind of a lack of rhythm a lot of the times with him. There was a lot of scrambling. There was a lot of uh, creation outside the pocket. But he did a great job with it. I mean... The, the Falcons' pass rushers overall couldn't touch him, couldn't get home, and when they did, he'd make a miss, ripped off some long ones, bailed him out of some tough situations. So, yeah, I thought that Hurts did enough to, to win the game, or I thought he did. Um, he also had a brilliant touchdown to Devontae Smith at the back of the end zone, holding Bates with his eyes and then hitting that bender as it goes up and around the linebacker between the two safeties. Looked like pretty much triple coverage by the time the ball actually got there, but it was thrown with such great timing and location that only Smith got a shot at it. So, like, from the beginning of the game to the end of the game, yes, there were missed opportunities, but I still thought it was an acceptable performance without A.J. Brown. Uh, not ideal, but acceptable. Saquon was running well for the most part. Just got to execute in the red zone. This is what happens, and it's something that we've seen a lot so far this season. There haven't been many touchdowns. A lot of it has been on the, the field goal kickers across every game so far this season. And this game was, was no different. They get down to the red zone once they call... 
mesh against zone. Just not a very good play in that moment against that defense. Kirk has to, not Kirk, Hurts has to throw it kind of away. He targeted Johnny Wilson in the back of the end zone. Uh, there was a defender there, just kind of bounced off of his hands and out of bounds pretty harmlessly. And then on the next play, Hurts tried to create something. That was when one where I thought maybe there was a little bit too much creation from Hurts. Uh, he read the front side. I thought maybe they could get the ball to Barkley in the flat with this pick play that they were running. He, Hertz decided to hold on to the ball, but he didn't move to the back side in that moment. He scrambled out, kind of cut the field in half. Not cr crazy mad at it. You see a lot of the time that can work in the red zone. You roll out one way. You really put these defenders in a bind. Do you detach from your man and go after Hertz, or do you play soft and let Hertz potentially pick something up on the ground? I thought Dotson kind of sold in, the, in this play as well. Uh, Hertz rolled to his right, and then looked back left for Dotson, and he had cut upfield towards the back of the end zone instead of maybe settling into a softer amount of space for Hertz to just pick up the first down, because it wasn't, I think, first and goal at that point. It was like fourth and four in the red zone, or fourth and goal. And, and he just kind of made a, a silly decision in that scramble drill. His second reaction was not a good one. So when Hertz looked back, trying to pick up that first, throwing it against the grain, it, he was just kind of running himself into coverage. So they didn't execute there. And then obviously Saquon dropped one in the red zone. They kicked field goals or, or turned the ball, the ball over when they should have scored touchdowns. And the, the margins are just razor thin in this league. The, the Eagles, I think, are a pretty good team, pretty explosive team. The Falcons are pretty limited. It kind of felt that way over the course of the whole game that like the Eagles were going to put this one away. And it looked like they did, and then you just take your foot off the gas for one second, and, and things can get things can get out of hand. Things can get out of hand. So the the more concerning part about the Eagles' performance, I think, came from the defensive side of the ball. Though offense wasn't perfect, but it was still, I think, fine. The the players Smith. Saquon, Hurts all played well, fine. The line played pretty well overall. But on the defensive side, the stars who needed to play well were not playing well. Okay, and I'm officially very concerned about this front seven for the Eagles, especially the edge rusher play. Everyone just looks so small, and everyone is so small. Nolan Smith is out there a lot. He is literally the smallest edge rusher in the league, and I was really high on him as a prospect. I loved even though he was small, the physicality that, that he played with, uh, the technique that I thought could he could make up some ground with how he played everything. Like, we've seen undersized players, if they have the right mentality, uh, be physical enough before. I thought he could be one of them, but no. Not really. Josh Sweat, complete invisible. He's, he's invisible. I don't know if it's the number change but he looks way smaller these days he does not have a sack he has 10 pressures the stars on the offensive side of the ball showed out they did what they needed to do i think but the stars on the defensive side of the ball have not done enough I'm officially concerned about this front seven, averaging 4.6 yards per carry so far through two weeks. That is a bottom 10 mark in the league. And if it wasn't for that first half against Josh Jacobs, like the last three halves of play, it has been really ugly. It has been really ugly. They can't set an edge. Their edge rushers are so small. Nolan Smith, tiny, right, he is struggling. I thought I liked him as a prospect. I thought he made up for his lack of size with his technique, his tenacity, but he's just getting overwhelmed. On the other side, Josh Sweat looks smaller than I feel like I remember. Maybe it's the number change going from like 90s to a, a number in like the teens. Maybe that's just messing with my brain and just the fact that he's not playing very well. Zero sacks for him. Zero sacks 
for Nolan Smith, zero sacks for Bryce Huff, who is also way on the smaller side. He was a, a third down situational guy for the Jets last year. Now he's coming in. And not all these guys kind of seem like that. They're supposed to be in uh, situational downs where they can pin their ears back and get upfield, not have to hold up so much at the point of attack or versus double teams. But right now, you know, they're out there all the time. And, and Bijan was effortlessly able to get to the e edge the corners as well really struggle to fit the run. Like Drake London would just get right up on the safety, um, make that corner the free hitter. And Slay and Quinion Mitchell were just kind of slow to react to that. Like, hey, that, there's you're on blocks. You have to see the run coming your way. You have to constrict the space. And they're just getting depth, getting depth, getting depth, waiting to catch it, waiting for someone else to make the play. No, it's you. It's you. So between the corners and the edge defenders and... You know, the linebackers, N'Kobe Dean has had his moments. Zach Bond has had his moments blowing plays up against the Packers last year. But where are they going to be consistent over the course of the year? Because I thought they were kind of over committing to certain gaps in, in, in the last game and not being playing patient and being able to fall back and making plays where they were supposed to and helping out the defensive linemen. Jalen Carter getting reached constantly in the run game, uh, sealed off. Chris Lindstrom had a great game, I thought, uh, in run blocking, getting to the second level pretty much untouched, diving at people, uh, cutting them and, and knocking them down. It was, it was just a death by a million cuts for the Philadelphia Eagles defense until the end when they just completely collapsed. Not sure what was going on there. Haven't checked it out on the All-22 yet. It looks like uh, they were playing zone coverage, and they just got high load and were being too aggressive and let some things go right behind them. Mitchell, the rookie, got picked on, it seemed like, on that drive, and Slay got beat badly by, by Drake London. Just count the good players on this defense. They've got some guys who are capable of winning quickly. It feels like they can... There's a couple reps a game where they just blow you up right off the snap, swim you arm over, and just ruin the play, and it looks great. And they're, they're able to do that a decent amount over the course of the game. But also over the course of the game, what they are giving up in the run game over and over and over and over again, and when they do get shut down and Jordan Davis gets no push or you know someone gets reached or you know these little individual one-on-one -on -one losses that just pile up, pile, pile, pile up over the course of the game. And it, it starts to matter. And then when you look at who's consistently being a positive on their front seven or on their team, instead of these moments of greatness, there's very few people who are consistent. There's very few people who every down, every play are, are winning what they need to win. And they're playing their two high shells. I uh, thought it might be a problem for them. Going into the game, like, I had the Bijan overs, by the way, I'm going to complain here for a second. I had the Bijan overs because of the two high structure, like the Steelers were playing one high, bare front all game. I think that's what you should do against the Falcons uh, to shut down this running game in Bijan. Uh, it was more two high shell, look at everything from depth, uh, rotate people down. But, like, the main thing you got to take away is Robinson. So you might as well just put him on the line of scrimmage right, right away, I feel like. But I, I thought, you know, they would score more in the red zone and the, the Eagles would actually win this game more easily than they did. Like, I thought it could maybe just be Bijan that has a good game. Instead, not only is he killing everybody, but Kirk Cousins ends up playing or producing at a really high level. I mean... I think that there were still pretty clear limitations from him, some missed throws, some hesitancy, some stiffness, right? But 0.23 EPA per play, pretty good stuff on a, on a decently deep average depth of target. Ended up being quite efficient. Where it, I don't even look at real box scores anymore. I just go right to the EPA ones. I should probably say what he actually did because these numbers are more impressive I guess 69 percent completion rate 241 yards two touchdowns zero interceptions and 117 rating this week 
definitely looked limited, but when you, you those are your numbers at the end of the day, um, it's hard to it's hard to say that I'm, I'm lowering my Michael Penix watch meter back down to a. I was at a code blue after last week. We're back at code green. It's it's gonna probably be Kirk all year. This game did make me feel a lot better. I know I was watching the Manning cast and. <laughs> Peyton said he talked to Kirk Cousins, and the lack of play action last week was a Steelers thing, is what Kirk Cousins said. And and I can understand that to a certain extent. They're very good at disguising coverages when Micah, uh, not Micah Parsons, Minka Fitzpatrick is fully healthy. You know, he is a master at taking things away when the quarterback's back is turned and getting interceptions in that scenario. So I get not wanting to turn your back to the Steelers, but... To not do it one time, it made me think like, oh, Kirk can't do it. Like the Achilles is is really cooked if you didn't even do it one time. And then this week they show up, they're under center. Like Philly disguises things too, but I guess they just remembered that play action is a useful thing to do at least once. Um, and things did look a whole lot better this week. With that back in the game plan, I'd don't know why it was ever gone completely, but whatever, fine. Okay, it's back. And Kirk, you know, it, he was pretty much a statue last year. Like, it wasn't really that much better for him uh, moving around before his Achilles tear. He was still able to access all that play action stuff and move off his spot a little bit. And if he can do that kind of stuff again all year this season, it should be... I don't know. It should be... I'm, I'm, I may have overreacted to week one, is what I'm saying. Drake London, I thought, looked amazing in this one. He didn't have a huge day, but he reminded me of just how good of a route runner that he is. His route at the end on Slay, it looked like his feet were barely touching the ground. He was able to freeze them, change direction so fast, just absolutely beautiful work from him. So agile, like, such a good contested catch guy. Not going to take the top off with his speed, but underneath and in the intermediate areas, he is still a crazy weapon. He can block his ass off as well, which is super important in this scheme that is constantly trying to get to the perimeter. So he, he's a massive positive for them. They just need to get somebody, another wide receiver, to take some of the, the brackets off of him potentially because he really is an easy guy to key in on right now. Um, Kyle Pitts should be that guy. I mean, as a tight end, I think sometimes it's tough with the routes you're able to run, um, you know, chip and release. Um, it should have been a bigger game for him, certainly, but I don't. they need a wide receiver, you know what I'm saying. They need a second wide receiver to stretch the field and, and take some of the pressure off London. But he, I think, is still uh, pretty pretty elite. Fantasy-wise, I don't know if he's going to live up to totally where he was drafted because of all those brackets and like the overall limitations of this offense because Kirk still is like slightly, slightly washed, I'd say. Uh, just not as washed as I thought. And then uh, what a game from Bijan Robinson. Just so good in pass protection, first of all unbelievable like standing everybody up knocking people to the ground i tweeted his chip on nolan smith uh where he just flattened him like absolutely annihilated him on that same play chris lindstrom lost uh it was one of those quick l's that the eagles are capable of generating just beat right off the snap uh, across his face and and milton williams killed kirk cousins but I liked that chip from Bijan, and then he had a monster rep of pass protection on the touchdown to Mooney, where he took uh, he took Nicobe Dean blitzing right up the a gap. So if he's going to be doing that and be a posi such a positive running the ball and be the most elusive guy in the league, and he can catch as well, although he did kind of drop one in this game, hasn't really shown the full extent of his receiving capabilities so far yet this year. But a uh, really good game from him. He kind of carried the the Falcons to a win like he's supposed to. So, maybe not full alarm bells yet for the Falcons. I don't think it's full alarm bells yet for the Eagles either just because they did beat the Packers. I know it wasn't a pretty game, but 
you look at the NFC right now, and just because the Eagles dropped the tough one and choked, it doesn't mean that there aren't still positives from them at the beginning of this year. Like, Saquon does look good. The line does look pretty good. It's not like Jalen Hurts is a complete mess versus the pressure packages. So without A.J. Brown dropping an embarrassing one, like, it doesn't mean the season is over. I'm not out on them. But their offense is going to have to be top five for them to be real contenders because this defense is going to have to get carried is, is where I'm at. The new defensive coordinator, he can't make everybody bigger. So, or smaller, in maybe the case of one of their defensive tackles. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see. They're flawed, but they're, I'm not out on them. Let's talk about one of these other upsets. Let's see. Let's see. We'll go to the Raiders versus the Ravens. This one was quite confusing to me because the first half, the Ravens' defense was absolutely dominant. I thought Minshew was going to get benched. They were swarming him. They were getting pressure. They were taking the ball away. They were really kicking their teeth in. It just did not seem like they would be able to threaten at all. But to the Raiders' credit, they kept dropping back. And they have half of a really, really good passing attack. They have the weapons. I love the way the skill position room is built, or the wide receiver room is built, because the running back room uh, counts as skill position. Tucker, Adams, Bowers, Mayer, Myers. Just a really nice array of skill sets. I've been so impressed with Tucker so far this season obviously had an amazing preseason hasn't had a ton of opportunities uh, obviously as a uh, not the main target getter in an offense that isn't super potent but every time he has gotten a look i feel like he has made a play made the most of it he's someone that you can't really leave one-on-one -on -one if he is the solo guy in trips if he's that X, because he's got the speed to, to take the top off, and he showed in preseason how good he is tracking the ball and making catches out in front of him. Then there's Devontae Adams, who can obviously also be the X in the trips, and you must double him. No matter where he is, you must double him. He played great. He had one of the all-time sideline catches in this game, put it in the one minute of sideline catches compilation that I see on TikTok all the time, because this was about as aesthetically pleasing of a football play as you can possibly get, like parallel with the ground. The ball is almost, it's not only a sideline catch, the ball is almost past the white stripe of the sideline. And he is still just Michael Jackson leaning forward with both toes down, making the catch with full control. Beautiful stuff, he hit a go route later, waited, 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 the ball was in the air, just no reaction from Adams. The ball pretty much hits him right in the chest, and that's when he just reaches up and, and pins it there. Just no chance for the corner to, to be aware of what's going on. And um, Bowers, too. He had a fantastic game. They don't win that one without him. He had a dig versus quarters, it looked like. So he, there was a window where you know he broke inside, and Humphrey was on his outside shoulder, and then he had to catch it before, you know, the safety drove down. Good timing from Minshew on this particular play. And just a good route by Bowers. A sudden turn, not really giving anything away. Holding his line, creating that separation versus a good corner. And then when the ball was on its way, he tracked it so beautifully. I thought on the replay you could do a really good job watching him looking the ball into his hands. And this is something that's a day one coaching point. And it's something that I always love to slow down and look to see if it's happening. When I look at wide receivers catching the, catching the ball, making these contested grabs, like can you literally see their eyes on the replay looking the ball past the corner into their hands? It doesn't always happen, but when it does, it is pretty beautiful to watch. And that's exactly what Bowers did here. 
Humphrey was in tight coverage. He's a good player. He dove in front of the ball and reached out a hand, and Bowers watched it pass right by the fingertips, watched it pass his eye line, which isn't easy to do when a ball moves past your face and you have to catch it behind you, but that's what he did. Made that tough catch behind and was able to beat the tight coverage. Reminded me a little bit, the guy who is the best at this, the guy who is the best to study when it comes to perfect catching technique no matter the situation, Justin Jefferson, when it comes to making catches past your eye line, like letting it whiz past the corner and then catching it behind everybody, like that is Justin Jefferson. And that's how, that's what Brock Bowers reminded me of in that moment. He caught a pass where he was going up the seam. Minshew bailed out and Bowers had a second reaction. He worked back to Minshew in the scramble drill. Minshew just threw up a Bowers over there somewhere ball. He caught it, contested, and then spun out of the first hit, spun out of the second. I thought he was gonna truck into the end zone and score. Ended up being down at the one. They punched it in on the next play. He had a route, a little like post corner against zone that was wide open. He has been fantastic. Uh, listen to the the PFN Fantasy Podcast with me, Derek Tate, and Kyle Soppy. Soppy had a wonderful statistic where he pointed out that Bowers has the most yards through his first two games of any tight end this millennium. All right, usually it's a slow start for these guys. Bowers immediately looks great. All right, he looks like one of the top tight ends in the entire league. And they can play 12 personnel very easily. They did it in this game. The Ravens tried to match that with their base defense, but that meant putting my, my nemesis number 40 on the, on the field, someone who I, who I thought needed to, to get benched immediately after his first performance against the Chiefs, where he was playing more off the ball. They did that. They put Simpson in off the ball every play this time around. But when it was a 3-4, you would still have Bauer. Uh, no, I keep thinking t Bowser. It's not ba It's Harrison, number forty. They would put him in there as an outside linebacker in the three-four, to sit the edge. You know, maybe not play so, uh, play so much in space. But when he was out there in twelve personnel or against twelve personnel, they would just drop back and target whoever he would drop out to defend in the flat, and he still can't make that tackle. So he, you just can't get him on the field. Like he's not a big positive rushing the passer you can't cover so as the offense dictates whether or not he's setting the edge right which is what um, Ravens fans tell me that he's notably good at but if they don't run it his way he's not doing that and what positive is he giving you then if he if they're forcing him to drop back or something like that so they couldn't play their 3-4 versus the 12 personnel uh, the Ravens couldn't and right away you could kind of see how being able to be so potent in 12 can mess with a, a defense by putting them in a formation or in a front that they wouldn't love to be playing in, but you kind of force them to when you put those heavier bodies out on the field. The Ravens actually stopped. They said, look, we're not going to go 3-4 anymore. Um, we're, going to, we're going to get in lighter boxes even against 12 and try to take away the pass, get the two high. This is where the Raiders need to get better. They need to be able to run when that happens. Uh, they were not able to do it. It should have been an L because of that. Like, okay, if they're in 12 personnel and we can match that with a lighter with lighter bodies and they still can't run, it should pretty much be a free win. But the skill position talent was so good in this game. Adams and Bowers were just so dominant and winning all of their matchups that eventually they were able to generate offense in the second half, even against the unfavorable looks, even um, playing from behind, even with Minshew struggling. So if the, if they can get a good a better quarterback in there, like the the Raiders are a threat. But at the moment, they're going to remain super inconsistent, and teams will kind of need them beat. Teams will kind of need to beat themselves for the Raiders to to get a good clean win. I think with Minshew in there.
Maybe I, I, I am intrigued by the potential of O'Connell, though. I mean, he is on the bench right now. I, I mentioned before on this podcast in the preseason that I thought that was the wrong decision. I think if he can just drop back, and maybe he's not much of a runner, but if he can be better at Minshew at picking apart these zone coverages, like the weapons, if they can get a quarterback like that, make this very intriguing. But the line and the running back situation needs to get better. Overall, though, good stuff from the offense. Uh, Bowers is being fun rules. And they didn't sell the game and give it away like they did last week with, with punts and, and silly clock decisions and Minshew just the ball slipping out of his hands and things like that. The Ravens, I'm beginning to get a little bit concerned. I mean, they're still in a pretty good situation within the division because the Bengals are 0-2, the Browns are 1-1, one one, but their offense doesn't look fixed at all. Uh, the Steelers are 2-0. and oh. Maybe the, like that's a little bit concerning getting, considering the, the success that Tomlin always has. In the, in the division, but I don't think it's impossible that the Ravens can zoom past the Steelers pretty easily. As long as the Bengals don't look like they're back, the Ravens should feel okay, but being 0-2 hurts. They've only been 0-2 a small handful of times in the past two decades, and they've missed the playoffs every time that they have been that. So it is, you got to hit some pan- level of panic, especially about the offensive line. Just not athletic enough. I wanted to give the Ravens credit. I was crazy high on them because they can develop offensive linemen. They have this track record. Lamar has won 75% of his games in his career. So the fact that they were swapping some players in and out, I thought, you know, they could they could develop and it could look fine. They could, you know, win the, win the game against the Chiefs even and, and obviously get this win against the Raiders early. And right now the line has just kind of prevented that from being able to happen. Early in this game, they were trying to run gap scheme, pulling guards, right, meeting people, meeting edge rushers, kicking people out. They just couldn't get to their spots. Max Crosby is an explosive, fast dude. Voorhees trying to reach him just wasn't working. He he was just untouched in these power runs or counter runs. Falele, same thing. His feet just aren't fast enough to to get to where he needs to go. whether that be pulling, whether that be in zone, climbing to the second level, whether that be in pass protection, trying to pick up a stunt. He can't do any of it. I think it's fair to question giving uh, Zeitler away this offseason, and and right now they are really struggling. The right side of that offensive line is getting their teeth kicked in, and I think the weapons are fine-ish for Lamar. I think he's done a really nice job scrambling this year, like on the ground this has a chance to be his best year yet. Under pressure, he is scrambling more than he's taking sacks, which is pretty unreal. Um, Think about that. Almost every quarterback, even the best ones, are negatives under pressure. Um, When he is under pressure more than he is actually getting hit and going down, he's making everybody miss and actually turning it into a positive for for the Ravens offense with his legs. Him and Josh Allen are both Uh, They're the only quarterbacks doing that right now, converting pressures into scrambles instead of stack at a higher rate than they're turning into sacks. Uh, PFF Moo tweeted that stat. I thought it was very interesting and a good way to say, like, hey, Lamar's doing all all he can, I think. Uh, He's playing pretty well these first two weeks. It's not like he's a disaster or anything like that. But when you're not connecting on the deep ball and he isn't, it's a tough way to live, scrambling all the time and being under pressure all the time. So he's made some highlight plays. He's looked like he could be an MVP again if he was protected, but he's just not protected right now. And the weakness of the deep ball, which was there last year when he won MVP. So I think he can win MVP even if that is uh, not the biggest strength of his game. Everybody's got something that they're not the best at, I guess. Uh, but, yeah, that is, that is a problem. That is a problem. Those two things. They need to be more explosive, and they can't just give up pressure. Max Crosby, they had a chance to put the game away. They just ran Max Crosby on a stunt. Falele's got to detach and pick it up. There's no chance. There's no chance. So he wrecked the game. He wrecked the game. All, last week did a great job at him. Slater, he had to get his production over the guards. Um, this week, didn't matter where he was lined up. He could kick anybody's ass. So, 
just unfortunate to see a pretty good defensive performance in the first half wasted like that. Justin Tucker m missed a kick. Again, not a lot of touchdowns for them. A lot of field goals. Common thread throughout the league right now. Got to cash these in. Or you're going to lose to a, a bad team. And again, level of concern with the Ravens. Not too crazy high. I do think they can work their way back and, and be in a position to control their own destiny to win the division um, going forward. If the defense, they're starting to smooth things out with the defense, like I think getting 40 off the field for Simpson the whole time was a good start. Uh, the defense did look dominant for the most part. Maybe they can make a trade for a lineman. Maybe they can make a switch. They got Ben Cleveland chilling on the bench. Like maybe he does a better job. I think he could certainly do a better job at this point. So they they don't have great answers on the line, but if they can get Falele maybe out of there and like Voorhees and Rose and Garden or something um, start to develop by the end of the year. Josh Jones is also on the bench. Maybe he could play guard as well. Like there are some tweaks they could make here. It's pretty thin. But there are some tweaks that I'd like to see them make uh, going forward for them to, to work their way back into this. And then Tucker needs to hit his damn field goals, is all I'll say. To be honest, I have not watched a second of Colts Packers yet. I must apologize for all the people who wanted to hear my analysis of that. I have not watched a single play. I, I don't know what happened. I saw Josh Myers threw up on the football at some point, and uh, <laughs> Willis didn't want to throw it. That that is the only thing I know that happened in this game, and and I know the stat line for Jacobs. That one I can just say I'm concerned about the Colts' run defense. Pretty simple. If you can just run wide zone against, if you have any kind of running back who can handle a workload, just run it against this front, and it doesn't seem like they can really do anything. So. That would be my takeaway there. I'll watch the film. I'll make a video about it, I'm sure. But on the podcast, can't say much about that. Buccaneers-Lions, let's talk about that one. Um, I watched the Buccaneers' defense more than I watched their offense when I went through the film. Kind of halved this one. But I can talk about what I saw. Really good zone coverage from the Buccaneers. I, I love their secondary even without Antoine Winfield Jr., it was a massive positive in this game. If you are a fan of a team that plays a lot of zone coverage and you're frustrated by it, like me with the Packers last year, and, and you want to see more man, this is a good game to turn on to see the benefits of what zone coverage can be. All the routes are leveraged. You're not running into, there, there's really not an easy way to beat anybody because if you make your break, they just fall off and hand it off to somebody else or they're keyed into the quarterback's eyes. They're looking through the route at the quarterback. So like the, the wide receiver can be stunting, you know, they can be running the most beautiful route in the world. But like the, if the corner is kind of only half paying attention to it and then like kind of keyed in on golf. It's easy to ignore the fakes and get breaks on the ball. It was it was it was gorgeous. It was absolutely gorgeous. Izian had some crazy PBUs. He chased some guys around uh, on whip routes and was able to change direction with them. Uh, that guys started in a too high shell and rotated down. Um, you would think like versus the too high, the middle of the field would be open, but they just float right down exactly to where the ball is going and created some collisions that went incomplete. Uh, they were able to play plenty of one high as well. Tons of middle field close for them somehow. Either they started and disguised or they started one high and just made it obvious what they were doing. They lived with some L's early. They got Jamison Williams on a safety in that one high look uh, for a huge, huge play. Amon Ross St. Brown ran some slants against linebackers and safeties as well that got completed. But overall, over the course of the game, to close the middle of the field like that, to put extra bodies in the box against the run, and make Goff throw it over and over and over again, it was a great formula. And Goff couldn't do it. And Goff has been not sharp these first two weeks. Bad picks. He should have thrown another one. He had two in the last game. Both were... 
pretty, the first one was a little bit forgivable because I think it's fair to say that that could have been called PI. It was a hard reroute by Izzy and he came down, uh, one of those disguises that I was talking about, came down, rerouted the inbreaker, def hit him hard, and hung up Williams. He didn't ever grab onto anything which saved him. He didn't like get a fistful of jersey. But it was enough contact that it kind of surprised me that it didn't get called. But it didn't, so you just got to chalk it up to a good reroute. And then McCollum squeezed uh, the inbreaker from his cover three spot and was able to um, take advantage of the missed timing and, and pick off the pass by, by kind of scraping over the top. So that was one pick. Another one happened. I don't even know what golf would do. I think he was under pressure and just threw it right to the post safety. I mean, no one else was there. And then he also had another one where he was under some pressure. Someone was running a comeback route versus cover, too. It was doubled, right? There's someone on top. There's someone right beneath it, and Goff just under pressure lost his mind, uh, threw it into the double coverage, and that one should have been picked. Last week as well, there were some big plays to Jamison Williams, but that was about it. Like, not much to Amon Ross St. Brown or Laporte these past few weeks. The Lions rank... 17th in passing EPA right now. They are below... Well, no, they, they rank 17th in overall EPA. My bad. And they have one of the best rushing EPAs in the league, which kind of lets you know how bad the passing offense has been so far. Where are they at? Drop back EPA. Oh, they are at number... Where are they? 25. 25th there above the Giants, the Browns, the Cowboys, the Titans, the Bears, the Broncos, and the Panthers. So kind of concerning company for them to be in. I mean, the, the Cowboys have a good quarterback. They're supposed to be a good offense. Uh, but every other team below them is, right, a bottom feeder, is quarterbacks at risk of getting benched that already have been benched that should be benched but can't because of investments, you know. And then there's the Lions right above it. So that is quite concerning, right? Goff needs to play better. He needs to do more uh, creative stuff in the pocket to, to beat these zone coverages. He needs to make people miss. He needs to hold guys with his eyes and then, and then move to another read. Like, you can't completely rely on the wide receivers to get themselves open. There needs to be a little bit from the quarterback as well to open them up with aggressiveness, with creativity, with uh, playmaking ability. Right now, that is, Goff is not providing any of that. The run game still looks great. Monty and Gibbs look fantastic. We know that Goff is capable of playing better uh, than, than this. I, I think that ranking 25th in passing EPA should probably be the floor for the Detroit Lions, but the fact that they're there, it is a little bit concerning. Uh, they're one and one. Certainly not a disaster. I haven't heard anybody pushing the panic button on them and they shouldn't but over time against a really short-handed Rams team that got obliterated by the Arizona Cardinals last week this week just straight up losing to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers it has been a a, real, a disappointing beginning to the season I, I do think it's gotten a, flown a little bit under the radar just how bad this passing offense has been and how bad Goff has been so something to keep an eye on, certainly. Uh, Goff was amazing for a while in that Shanahan, in that Shanahan scheme, uh, that McVay scheme, uh, until the, the line started to fall apart a little bit. Whitworth retired. They, they lost some talent, and then he just couldn't quite hang. After getting a huge contract, they ended up trading him away. The Lions now are supposed to be Super Bowl contenders right now, and it looks like Goff is fading just the tiniest bit. So he has to get back to form. And there's no reason why he shouldn't, because Jameson Williams looks incredible, right? Amon Ra is Amon Ra. Laporte is Laporte. He's got all the weapons that he needs. Like, the key was the Williams breakout, and it's happening. So where's the where's the output? Like, how is Williams looking good and the Lions offense looking terrible? <laughs> like, I, I don't understand that. So shout out the Buccaneers. Shout out McCollum and, and Dean and Whitehead and everybody uh, involved in that zone coverage, the passing off of everything, squeezing squeezing the brakes and, and being right there with it. Beautiful work by Bowles and company. Vita Vea got hurt in this one, but he was kind of wrecking the game early as well. Thought Yaya Diaby um, 
had some nice moments as well as kind of that outside linebacker uh, doing everything, dropping into coverage, rushing the passer, defending the run. So I thought that I thought that the Bucks looked good. And once Antoine Winfield comes back, they should be extremely formidable. And obviously the Saints look pretty great, and we'll get to them in a second. But uh, the Buccaneers look like they have been able to replicate last year's success when they almost went to the uh, NFC Championship game, to the divisional round, right? So shout out to him. Shout out to him. Chris Godwin, I know, looking great so far. I know I didn't watch a ton of the offense, but watched a little bit of the offense last week and this week. Was paying more attention to Jaden Daniels and Jared Goff, I will admit. But Godwin is blocking his ass off. He's, they're giving him the ball in these screen situations, and he fires me up whenever I see it because he gets straight north and south. There's no dancing. There's no east and west at all. It's just we're going as efficiently as possible towards the sticks. I love it. I love it. It's maybe the little thing in football that I enjoy the most is when – Guys are noticeably good at getting north and south and just eating up yardage, and he has been that. Um, he has been a great blocker. He has just been money. This, this entire receiving core, Evans has been money. Uh, I like what I've seen out of McMillan in the brief moments that I've seen him. Um, they, they were able to survive the backup right tackle that was getting, uh, getting killed by Aiden Hutchinson all game and, and win this one. Good work from them. I, I, I'm, I'm liking what I'm seeing. I'm liking what I'm seeing out of everybody. Another upset we got to talk about, the Minnesota Vikings. I talked about it on Thursday. Brian Flores, there you go, dude. Proof of concepts right there. Eyes in the backfield, looking at the quarterback, constricting space and zone. I mean, these guys are elite at causing havoc in the zone coverage. Last week, I, I detailed... Uh, play that Metellus had where Malik Neighbors settled down wide open. He was kind of the, the rat in the hole and had to range way over and make a diving PBU. This week it was Cashman who did that multiple, multiple times and, and came up with some big PBUs for them, including one that got tipped up in the air and uh, Metellus was able to pick it off. Pace had one of the most gorgeous run fits I've ever seen in my life on the goal line. He was... Moving straight east and west. I just talked about how I don't like east and west for running backs or ball carriers. I do love it for linebackers. It's another little thing that you just love. When a run is developing to the outside, you don't want to be coming downhill as a linebacker. I know that you want to make the tackle in the backfield. You want to limit space as much as possible. But the best way to do that is to move straight east and west because that makes it so the linemen have to go a really long way to get you. If you just stay at depth and move towards the direction that the run is going, these linemen can't reach you. That's what happened. Pace was able to stay out of the climbing guard's way and anticipate the cutback. He fell back perfectly with the runner and planted him in the backfield on third down. They went for it on fourth. It was a PBU. Man, uh, this, this defense is legit. We talk about how the Patriots are a little bit positionless and what a great job Belichick had done over the years with his game plans, to being able to take away your biggest threats, taking away your tendencies, and um, being unpredictable at the same time. Flores seems to have all of that right now. Uh, he would go with these three, four bare fronts on early downs and say, look, you can do whatever you want. You, you're not running. You, you're not running it easily. You're not death by a thousand cutsing us with Mason, like pounding over and over and over again into the line. We are putting bodies on the field to take that away. And we are making you throw short, outside the numbers. That is not Brock Purdy's game, you know, but that's what was there this day. And they didn't take it until it was too late. They pretty got into a little bit of a rhythm at the end of the game, just hitting comebacks on Stephon Gilmore. That's what he should be doing the whole time. But at the time that that started happening, the Vikings already had a pretty big lead. They got some breaks. The ball slipped out of Purdy's hands at one point. Um, the ball got blocked on a punt. And, and so those two things aren't going to happen every single week for you. But the fact that they did really tip the scales. Uh, 
the pass rush as well was extremely potent. I think Purdy got sacked five times. I feel like Patrick Jones, number 91, was a complete liability when I watched him a few years ago. Uh, this game, he was dominant. Uh, he was beating Trent Williams. They got a ton of pressure over that left side by distracting him with different looks and then sneaking in uh, pressure somewhere else. So they were able to get pressure from Purdy's left, probably something he's not used to. He had some moments where I thought he looked a little short. You know, he, he's not someone great at throwing it over pressure or um, navigating through that always, especially when it's on his interior. I thought there was a couple moments like that. Everything down the field was contested. Debo ended up having a, a productive day, but every single catch he made, he looked like Calvin Johnson. It was heavily contested, and he ended up getting banged up from overuse, and now he's going to be out several weeks. Uh, Steven Ruiz made a point I saw where Mason is good, but he's not explosive like McCaffrey is. Like He's this slow, bruising back. Uh, who can keep you on schedule and and run all these you know this outside zone plays right to a to a good level but not a great level and without McCaffrey's explosiveness uh, on runs on short passes things are just kind of getting a little bit overwhelming for Purdy that is kind of what it looked like in this game I mean I thought Purdy had an amazing week one against the Jets who have a great defense so like Obviously, it's only it's a week of good and a week of bad. But in this Vikings game, they, they definitely made him look extremely human. They missed the explosive plays. Ayuk has been quiet so far this year. I'll have to check out the tape more to figure out exactly what's going on with that. But Flores looks phenomenal. He looks phenomenal. Bynum, Pace, Smith, Gink, Van Ginkle, right, dropping into coverage. Like, there's just Harrison Phillips. Um, every, everybody's looking good. I, I, Cashman, Metellus, Patrick Jones now. Like, I, I haven't even mentioned um, their star acquisition, Grenard, who's had some nice flashes as well. It's a good-ass defense. And with Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison and eventually TJ Hawkinson coming back, I am, I am in on this team contending for the division. We had just talked about the struggles that the Lions have been having. Uh, the Packers are far from a, a perfect team, it seems, um, with Jordan Love banged up. And, you know, the, the defense maybe, in the, at least in the first game, if they're going to be playing man coverage against Justin Jefferson the whole day, like they, the Vikings can definitely beat them uh, if, if Darnold is on his game uh, as much as he has been these first two weeks. So super excited about what they're building. Kevin O'Connell and, and Brian Flores, if you could take the two of them, you would. I don't care what team you are. There's maybe McVeigh and Shanahan, but like to get two, to have two pretty elite coaches in your building on both sides of the ball, and and a pretty good array of talent at this point, I, I really don't see any reason why the Vikings can't just be in it with with good defense and um, offensive production. Uh, as long as Justin Jefferson's quad injury isn't too bad. Let's talk about the winner of the week this week. Last week, it was the 49ers and their dominance showing over the Jets. They got the Stage 1 group win. For Stage 2, I get to talk about another upset. The New Orleans Saints smoking the Dallas Cowboys. Holy cow, 44-19. to 19. And this podcast called it, all right? If you're, a, if you're a listener to your football opinion, this shouldn't be any kind of surprise to you. We know that the Saints' offensive line fits the scheme perfectly. I watched a, um, a clinic a couple of months ago from uh, Sonny Dykes. Is that the TCU head coach? And he talked about how the identity of your offense stems from your offensive line. All right, that's the first thing that you build. If you have a bunch of agile guys, you run plays that let them get out there and, and show that. If you have a bunch of heavy hitters, you want them delivering down blocks and pulling and, and clearing guys out. And, and that's kind of the first thing that you want to get figured out is what he was talking about in that clinic. I have never seen that sentiment in practice as much as I have with these New Orleans Saints. Every single one of their linemen is just this absolute freak of nature in the running game. Caesar Ruiz, like last week it was mostly McCoy 
and Fuaga that, that had all the highlights, that had the super high-level blocks, I thought. This week, Cesar Ruiz was, was the biggest playmaker for them. And that's really what these linemen are, the playmakers of the team. right? I, I could put together a highlight tape that would rival any wide receivers from a game. Just of this, just of this offensive line, right? They can reach people. They put you on your ass. Like in this scheme, Penning, who has been a massive bust, is just getting pancake after pancake. McCoy and Fuaga were still dominant. Even Lucas Patrick, uh, the left guard, probably the, the not, not the biggest name from this line, but even he he has his share of, of big time plays. And Kamara is running two, three yards down the field before even getting touched. I mean, that's what the averages say. Uh, if we look at the yards before contact, it's like Lamar Jackson, <laughs> which doesn't count because he's a quarterback, and then it is Alvin Kamara, on average getting two yards before even getting hit. And in this game, it feels like seven. It feels like eight. I mean, there are plays where he doesn't get touched at all, especially when you think about the screens as well. Yeah, Alvin Kamara, 2.89 yards per carry per rush before getting touched. Look at some of the other leaders. Jordan Mason is at 1.71. Josh Jacobs is at 1.19. Uh, Joe Mixon is at 1.14. James Conner is at 1.14. B. John Robinson is at 1.97. So to be at 2.89, just to give you a, that should give you some indication of just how special he is or how special this is that he is uh has this much space to work. He's averaging 5.7 yards per carry. Camara is. And it's it's tough to see how this falls off unless there's injury. I mean, when you have Josh Allen and your drop back passing game is efficient, you're not like, oh, it'll regress because you know that Josh Allen is just a freak and he's able to do these things at a high level and no one can really stop it. When I look at the Saints' offensive line and, and how good they are and how much of an outlier they are in the running game, like, yeah, you would think because it's so good it has to regress maybe a little bit, but also at the same time, they just have the, the right people to do this. And yes, the, the Cowboys and the Panthers aren't the best at defending this exact scheme, but still, I mean, it, it should be a ball game versus just about anybody because not only is the run game always going to be there for you, I love their weapons as well. I mean, Shahid has been phenomenal. Maybe the best deep threat in the league this year. And then Olave, don't forget about him. He wasn't super productive last week because they didn't really need him to be. This week, his playmaking ability was in full force. He had a, a route uh, and a catch on the one-yard line. Kind of the same deal as London, like he's way lighter, but just how fluid he is, how fast he is, how his feet barely seem to be hitting the ground as he can put a move on someone and just, they're just tapping ever so lightly on the ground. It's just beautiful to watch him change direction like that. It's kind of unguardable. The corner tried to speed turn, but Olave had separation. He adjusted to a ball thrown behind him made an athletic, contorting, contested catch, survived the ground, his head hit the ground pretty nasty, held on to it, popped the right back up, got back to the huddle. Uh, he had an in-breaker. You know how it is. They run this wide zone. Everybody's so scared of it. You're not even worried about Carr at this point. Carr, Carr has only been hit three times, and I think he's only been pressured nine in two weeks. Nine times in two weeks. Because... Fuck their car if you're the defense. We got to get to Camara. We got to flow with this wide zone. If Carr keeps the ball, like, fine, the ball is in Derek's car's hands. This is an offense where the, the threat of the run is just so dangerous that I think, like, these pressure numbers are ridiculous. The The 49ers are amazing at running wide zone, right? The, the, the 49ers can have been doing it and getting to the Super Bowl for a long time. They haven't had this much of a threat, I feel like, to the outside where their quarterback is getting pressured nine times in two weeks. Again, Panthers have a lot to do with that, but still, like, you just played Micah Parsons and Trevor Penning was on him, you know what I mean? I thought I thought this would be a closer game because I thought there was no way the, the Saints could avoid dropbacks enough where, like, Parsons wouldn't get, a, like, a strip sack on, on, on Carr and, like, change the game. Something like that. I, I knew that the 
Saints would be able to move the ball on the ground, but to just make the pass rush a complete non-factor because the running game is that good is ridiculous. And then Carr, Carr can play action off of that. Olave runs these in-breakers like, with the best of them. It's a great situation. And I look at how sustainable this is for the Saints. It's very sustainable. All right, I've been high on the Saints. I've been saying good things about them. Let's turn it up a notch. This is very sustainable for the Saints because who in the NFC can really consistently stop this? I mean, the Eagles are flawed. The Cowboys are flawed. The Lions are looking flawed. The Packers are looking a little flawed. In the NFC West, like Kirk, uh, Christian McCaffrey is on IR and, and the 49ers just lost. So... Why not the Saints? They've got this great rushing attack. They've got these weapons. They've got a defense that can jam you at the line of scrimmage and play really tight man coverage. They've got a million good players um, on the defensive side of the ball in the secondary. Chase Young is a positive, I think. Brzee, Granderson, Cam Jordan, Demario Davis is still maybe the best linebacker in the league. He was unbelievable unbelievable against the Cowboys he just rises to the occasion in a big game like he's going to be at his best he can still cover like if he has to go cover someone he'll just get on the line two hand jam them <laughs> and and it's tough to deal with his physicality he stays in the run game he stays so square and delivers such punishing hits and just glances off the contact from the offensive lineman like he's a rare breed in today's NFL and He's, he's one of the most valuable defensive players in the league so far this season. Like, he is playing out unbelievably good football for his age and for not even for his age, just in general. So, when you combine this offense with that defense, it's like, okay, they can tear through the Cowboys like they're, like they're nothing. I think if they played the Eagles, they could tear through the Eagles like they're nothing. I think if they played the, the Lions, like, there's a very real chance Goff struggles, you know? If they play the Packers... Like, right now, like, they're, they're taking probably the Saints. Like, they look so good. And, and they look like they could be dark horse contenders to go to the Super Bowl. Not, like, that's not my prediction. But I, I'm putting them in that contender tier this year after what I've seen the first two weeks. I'm staying. I'm staying on the bandwagon. As the expert, I was ahead of the, the curb. Before the season, I'm not going to remain the same. They're even better than I thought, and I thought they'd be a playoff team. So what's the next logical? How do I stay ahead? I got to bet on the Saints to be playing maybe in the divisional round. Maybe they're, the, maybe they're in the NFC Championship game. Pack, Packers-Saints, AFC cha- NFC Championship game? Maybe, maybe that's a, a hot take. I don't know. I, I think they can do it, though. We'll say, we'll say that I think the Saints can get to the NFC Championship game. I don't know if they'll beat the 49ers in the end or if one of these big NFC contenders is playing better football at the most important time. There are teams that maybe have a little bit more talent. I am a little bit concerned if it does become more of a shootout about the Saints' ability to drop back and pass the entire game. But I just don't think it's going to be an issue for them in a lot of games this season. They've got a great formula. So we're an hour into this. Uh, That'll do it for another episode of Your Football Opinion. Thank you all so much for listening. Be sure to follow me on Twitter and TikTok for more breakdowns on games I haven't talked about at Theo Ash NFL on Twitter and TikTok, yeah. And uh, PFN365 on those same platforms. I think they're on platforms I'm not even on, like Facebook. So check them out wherever. And then, of course, subscribe to the podcast if you haven't. Check out the other PFN podcasts as well, the Fantasy Show uh, with the brilliant Derek Tate and Kyle Sapi. I'm on there twice a week, and then they do some daily fantasy um, shows that I'm not on as well. Be sure to check those out because uh, I guess I, didn't, I don't know, but Sapi told us that it, you, they kind of cleaned up last week and they made banks. So it doesn't surprise me. Like <laughs> they're they're pretty smart with the with the numbers and the trends and the trajectories of everything. So check out all that other content, and I will see y'all on Friday. <laughs>